this is the first ever live panel for at least the grad student part of the Motivation SIG. Um, and we're really excited to have uh, Dr. Kate Snyder from the University of Louisville, um, Associate Professor in the Department of Counseling and Human Development. Uh, Dr. Katie Minks from the University of Texas in Austin, uh, Assistant Professor in, in the Department of Educational Psychology. And Dr. Ben Hetty at the University of Oklahoma, Assistant Professor in the Department of uh, Educational Psychology as well. I'm Patrick Beamer. Um, I'm part of the, Ma the Motivation SIG uh, Grad Student Committee. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you all for doing this. Uh, I'm really excited. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so it is a little bit over five, so we'll jump right into it. Um, so first question, and these are all questions uh, submitted from uh, students or postdocs who, who were interested in attending. So our first question is, could you speak a little bit about uh, the differences in applying to different types of faculty positions? So um, faculty positions such as research-focused positions or teaching-focused positions, um, and from the other side of things, um, what might these universities look for in a candidate? <laughs> I feel like I should be like, uh, Kate. What? <laughs> I can I can jump in. I can jump in first on that one. Um, so I've I've found that applying to a research university or a teaching focused university, uh, I had the most luck when I didn't change a whole lot in my application to those universities. Uh, I've been finding that um, teaching universities want somebody who's involved in research as well, uh, just you know, almost as much as a research university. And that's because you'll be training undergrads uh, on research. And so I always give the advice to my own students to still start with research and then go into teaching and service. The only time I would suggest to um, um, go against that is if you're applying to a community college or a place where you know the teaching load is 4-4 or 5-5, and that means 4-4 uh, four, four is four classes per semester, fall and spring. And if that's the case, then you might put teaching first in your personal statement and on your uh, CV, but otherwise I would, I would keep it the same. Yeah, my only experience is with um, more research focused um, positions and what I found is, yeah, you really, for those you really want to emphasize on your CV, you want all your research to come first and uh, you want it, that to be a really, um, you want to spend a lot of time on your research statement and teaching is still important, but, um, but yeah, they definitely are looking more for research, but I also didn't apply to any teaching focused positions. So I don't know from that end of things what that, how that would look different. Yeah, I also like Katie have just focused mostly on the research focused institution. So where I was trained and where I ended up. Um, when you talk about, or when everyone talks about teaching focused institutions, I have heard from my liberal arts colleagues that um, sometimes they have course loads that are even lower than some of the research focused institutions. And so to be careful about calling them just like a teaching focused institution, it's still research focused, just in a very different way, like what Ben had said. Um, so similarly, could you talk a little bit about uh, some of the differences uh, there are between the, uh, these types of positions that you just spoke about uh, and postdoc positions? Um, Katie, maybe you wanna, wanna start? I know um, you and I have talked a little bit about postdoc positions before. Yeah, I mean, so I would say a postdoc is a really, really good idea if um, if you want to go for more of like a research focused uh, faculty position because having a postdoc usually, um, if it's a research based postdoc, that is going to give you a lot more experience, um, or it, it's going to give you more time. <laughs> a so just time to get out, sort of get your CV in a, in better shape. Um, and it's also going to give you more training and ideally some different, uh, you'd work in sort of a different type of lab. And so you get, um, some different training. Um, I think as far as application for a postdoc, uh, if it is a research based postdoc, it's probably going to be all research and no teaching at all, unless, um, unless the postdoc does involve re uh, teaching, but, um, but so your applications for that are probably going to be a lot more sort of research focused, um, what I found with postdocs 
I think it kind of varies a lot as far as the application process. I think for faculty jobs, it is a lot more, um, there's a lot more, it's a lot more formal, I guess. And some postdocs also have a formal application process Class, but there's also postdocs that you just hear about through the grapevine and you just send someone your materials or you send them things that uh, that they'd be interested in like your CV or your research statement um, so it's a little bit more varied as far as uh, the different positions might have different things that they want in your application um, but I would just say as a general point if you are looking for a, a research um, job as like an assistant professor I think having a research postdoc after grad school is a really good idea so I can talk about it um, from a little bit different angle in terms of hiring a postdoc, but hiring a postdoc that wasn't a research focused postdoc. So there are postdocs that are more like, so for our grant, it was going to be someone who was working directly in the schools, helping to coordinate the basics of the grant. And we offered the opportunity if they wanted to teach some classes for like additional adjunct fees. Um, and we ended up finding someone who was coming out of a school psychology program. It was a great fit for her. She didn't want to go into academia, but it really gave her some more time to really gain that you know, um, experience with doing research in schools, gaining some teaching experience, and moving on from there. Um, so there are postdocs out there that aren't research focused. Um, the key is just to look for what they're advertising in the description. So we were pretty upfront about the fact that it wasn't research focused. So if you're thinking the more research one assistant professor track, our postdoc would not have been a good idea. So it's all about fit. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is that I think there's this view that, um, you know, if you, if you can't get a faculty job, you do this postdoc. I don't think that's the case at all anymore. I think uh, postdocs are a great opportunity to go continue training with somebody that can help you develop uh, some specific skills. So uh, if there's a good postdoc out there, I'd say go for it. Uh, similarly, uh, if, if you are, if that's your plan, uh, if you're planning to do a postdoc, um, do you have any insights on how close your research uh, should be in the postdoc to what you worked on uh, during your PhD program? I would say um, that it needs to be, there needs to be some connection or link. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say because I think it will also just depend on who is looking for a postdoc and what they're looking for. So again, it's kind of about fit. Um, but I do think, I think the value in a postdoc is partly that you are doing something different. Um, so for example, I did my PhD in uh, human development program and then I did a postdoc in a social psychology um, program and that I think was really good because the research was similar it wasn't exactly what I was doing but it was something I was interested in and it definitely had a similar type of focus but it was in it since it was in a different type of department um, I kind of got a whole new training of a whole sort of new area um, so I would say um, I guess for postdocs I mean if, if you have the resources to be able to apply relatively broadly, if, even if you think it's something that isn't exactly what you're doing, but you know, you're interested in it and it's something kind of different, I think um, it's all in the way that you kind of portray yourself and your interests and what you're looking for like in your application materials. So I wouldn't discourage people from uh, applying to something if it's kind of different than what they're doing, um, as long as there's some, some connecting thread that you can make. And I would imagine, Katie, that it was kind of appealing that you came from a human development background, so you brought you new, unique skills to them as well. So that like fit, exactly. but a little bit of not overlap was probably a benefit to them too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You'll most likely have an opportunity to interview, so um, you can ask them how much. You can ask whoever's running your postdoc how much you can integrate your area of expertise into their research, and if you get a feeling like it would be a good uh, connection, then uh, it might be a good opportunity. And then you'll know if it's not a good connection too, and you can turn it down. Hi. Um, we have some more participants, so I'm just going to keep reminding uh, the chat is open. If you have questions that come up, uh, please feel free to, to list them there. Um, next question we have here. Um, do you have advice on minimum requirements that one needs to be competitive. And some of the examples um, that were thrown out there were um, things such as publications, um, the quality of these publications, um, teaching experience, and uh, evidence of leadership or funding. 
Um, I'll also mention this quick, this quick moment. If you're if you're coming in and your video, uh, please keep your video off for recording purposes. Um, and then yeah, we can jump back to the question here. <laughs> I'll tackle this question because I hear it all the time and um, I recently got tenure and I heard it all the time for tenure too. And the answer is not anything that anyone wants to hear, but no, because it totally depends. Um, there are people who have gotten R1 jobs with one publication and there are people who have like a huge CV that struggle to find jobs. And as much as you might want this magical answer, it, you just never know. It totally depends. And I, I don't like that answer, but it's the truth. Yeah. Yeah, I'll add, uh, I agree, it depends. There's no magic number, but uh, it's all about fit. So um, the, the university that's hiring, they'll put out a job call and you wanna make it appear, and hopefully it's true, but you wanna make it appear in your uh, cover letter that you really fit the job call, that, that you're gonna bring something to the program. I'm on hiring committees here at OU and we just hired somebody with uh, two publications versus somebody who had, uh, you know, 20 publications that had gotten a bunch of grants just because they fit what we were looking for better. So um, there's no magic number. And then in addition, if you feel like you don't have that many publications, don't take yourself out of the running. Don't not submit because you don't feel like you're going to be competitive. You'd be surprised that if you fit, um, that, that you'll get an interview. And some places, if you have two, it sounds weird to say too many publications, but if you have somewhere with like a 4-4 or a huge teaching load, um, they might not want to interview you if you have too many publications because they're thinking you might not be happy there. You seem very research focused. So it, there is no magic number because for some places you might be too researchy. Yeah, I would say uh, my advice, if you're rather than focusing on, okay, how many, what is the number that I need to get? I think just, just try to make as much progress as you can on as many papers before you submit your application. So if something is like in press, that's basically the, the same as it being published. And if something is, uh, you know, has a revision invited, like that's gonna look better than um, just being submitted. And so just to show that, show your research, research pr productivity as much as you can and just try to, um, yeah, to get those projects moving as far along rather than I guess focusing on, oh, I need a certain number and, you know, that that's kind of your focus. Yeah. And then if you don't have a whole lot of publications or any, put an in preparation section on there just to show that you are working on some. Uh, just make sure they're actually in preparation. My, my rule has always been um, if it's written and you're working on revising the draft, then put it as in preparation. If it's not written yet, don't put it on there as in preparation. I'm going to make this panel fun and say that I've heard advice directly contradicting that, that people don't want to see it. No, I mean, that's the frustrating part about this is I've heard some people say, like, we don't like it when we see in prep on a CV. And I feel like I'm the, you know, downer voice on all of this. But sometimes, like, you get conflicting advice with these things. And so it's really hard to say. Yeah. And if you get conflicting advice, always go back and ask your advisor. Yes. They're always right. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> we, um, we have a question in the chat that is directly related, so I'll, I'm gonna pivot to this. Um, how do you know, um, how, how might you know that you fit that job well? Ben, you talked a little bit about fit, um, and they mentioned here, um, some of these positions don't exactly state, um, it, it's very broad sometimes. So how can you determine if you, if you are going to fit well or not? So yeah, so sometimes they'll say we're looking for somebody who studies motivation. Um, if you at all study anything related to motivation, I think that's a good opportunity for fit. If it's really broad, what I would suggest doing, and you have to be careful with this, um, and might get some conflicting advice, but um, I would look up the interests of people in the department, and I would call out the topics of interest of people in the department. I would say things in my cover letters that say, um, uh, so, somebody in your, or people in your department study this and this. I think that would fit well with my interest on this and this. Here's, the, here's a, an important point though. I never call out specific people. Hmm. Now this is where some, a couple other people might push back, but I never call out specific people because 
if you call out somebody specific and don't call out somebody else, somebody's feelings could be hurt and that's a good way to get tossed out of the pile. Somebody will say, well, I do that research, why not work with me, right? So I call out topics, not people, and that's a good way to show fit. Mm -hmm. um, another way to check out fit is to, and it's kind of related to Ben's point, is check out um, the CVs of the people in the department, look at the type of things they're studying. So some departments might not say, that they have a preference for basic research over applied, but if you notice that everyone's doing basic research and you're very applied, it might not be a fit. Um, that last part of the question in terms of them saying something and then they actually want something else, that happens and there's nothing you can do about it. If you know someone at the institution, you might be able to ask, um, but that's kind of the unfortunate part about the process is sometimes they do have something in mind and can't say it or don't say it and you, you just don't know. Sometimes I also heard it's in your favor, yeah. Yeah, I've also heard that sometimes they don't know what they want until they yeah. see the applications and then they decide from there, oh, this would be a good fit, but they don't like going into it, they don't necessarily have a, a certain yeah. thing in mind as well. So yeah, I think that's real. I think the advice that, um, that the other panelists gave is really good. Yeah. Sometimes you can just tell, I list, like I spent a lot of time when I was in the market digging around websites. And so for my department, for example, I noticed that everyone in the department seemed to be publishing a lot with students a lot with each other and a lot within the college. And so I made sure to bring that up. They didn't explicitly say in the call that that's something they wanted, but you can, you can tell. So digging around for those kinds of things. A uh, related question talking about um, fit here. Do you have advice on submitting applications when you might not meet the minimum requirements, um, but you think you still have the relevant skill sets? What are your thoughts on, on something like that? apply unless it's going to take like a huge time or emotional cost. I feel like I've heard that women are especially subject to this and saying, I'm not qualified. Um, so especially for women apply that you might be surprised. Yeah, I'd add, I'd add apply. Um, and the reason is that issue with fit. So you might not think that, you know, a, a good job uh, might come out and uh, they're looking for assistant, associate, or full, and you think, I can't, I can't compete about against associates and fulls, but you can because you're way cheaper as an, uh, as an assistant professor. They have to pay you less, and that, that actually matters um, as somebody who's on hiring committees, especially when you get to the administrative level. But also, your one publication or your, or your in-progress pubs, um, they may fit people in the department who really dig what you're doing, and then you're going to get an interview over somebody who has a lot. So uh, never take yourself out of the stack of applications. Let them take you out. Um, if you're just joining us, um, we ask that you turn off your video for uh, we're recording this, and we'll put it up on the Mozaic website later. Um, and we just want to we were hoping to just see our presenters here. Um, all right, so moving on to a next uh, line of questioning here. So our, our first set of questions uh, sort of got at this understanding the job posting and fit for the position. Um, our next set moves on to uh, what type of advice would you give for finalizing job materials? So um, first question, what are some things more specifically um, that you should include in your teaching and research statement and CV, your materials that you're going to submit to, to these job um, postings. So I just re-looked over my materials before this meeting to remind myself what I did. Um, so what I did for my teaching statement is I had one first introductory paragraph that was just like my basic, um, I guess, goals as a teacher and mentor. Um, and then I also had another paragraph talking about my experience as a teacher. So what I had, you know, my, just my teaching experience. Um, and then I had three sort of like principles that guided my teaching. Um, and these were just like kind of general broad things like um, facilitating motivation or like learning through interactions. And then I kind of had a couple paragraphs describing how I would integrate that into my teaching or mentoring. Um, for the research statement, I, um, what I've heard is it's good to have sort of lines of research or areas that you talk about. And so uh, what I've heard is, is that between two and four is a good number of sort of like 
ways to break up your research and that three is sort of a great number if you can do it that way, but kind of having like an introductory paragraph and then, um, and then getting into those lines of research and citing yourself as much as you can and showing what journals that you published in. Um, and then, you know, you're not going to be able to talk about every study you did in a ton of detail. So really just focusing on why it's important, what your major findings were and like how it fits with the rest of your research program. I think um, if that's made really clear, I think that uh, that helps a lot for them to kind of see who you are and what you're going to bring to the, the department as far as your research. And then for CV, I would say that is one thing that I didn't realize how, um, how much like having somebody look over your CV and give you feedback can really help to strengthen your CV. Like I just thought, oh, a CV is a CV, like, but really like what you highlight and where you put things and how you, what, yeah, how you organize it and how you present yourself can really um, make a big difference. So I, I would say that one's kind of dependent on the job that you're applying for. If it's a research job, you really want to put all your research stuff up front. Um, but I would say just have your advisor or other people look over your CV and give feedback. I, I do think that um, after I got feedback on it, I thought it was so much better. So I would recommend doing that. Um, in the research and teaching statements, um, it's really important to not only highlight what you've done and the specific examples and especially in the teaching statement not just saying you know like I do this thing but I do this class activity so they can get a clear picture and making sure that you don't just stop there but say this means that when I go to your institution and I teach this course and sometimes you can even pull like their course prefix and the numbers shows that you've gone to their website and know what it is um, I would do this same thing so I would make sure to do this in this introductory course same with the research statement making sure you either talk about mentoring grad students or mentoring undergrads that you know who they are so that they get a clear sense of not just what you look like currently, but you, what you would look like there. And that stuff takes a little bit of time to tailor, um, but it's worth it in terms of demonstrating fit. Those are great answers. I'm kind of taking notes myself. <laughs> um, I think, uh, let's see if I can add anything. For a CV, uh, I would just again emphasize what Katie emphasized that get your research up front as early as possible. I've been told kind of a rule is by the second page, you should be starting uh, your, your research and then go research, teaching, service, mm -hmm. uh, and then awards or, what, or whatever else comes next. I also like to have a final page. That's my references, three to five references. And that's just for name recognition, right? If they're looking through your CV and they're like, oh, I know that person, I met him at a conference one time. That's the kind of thing that can get you in the, the second, second look stack. Um, for, for personal statement, again, I like to go intro, research, teaching, service. Now, some places will ask for a research statement and some places won't. So if they don't ask for a research statement, uh, the bulk of your personal statement should be basically be a research statement where you're describing what you do and then get into teaching and service. Uh, when they do ask for a research statement, then your personal statement is going to look a little different. You're going to be a little more broad on your research uh, in, in your personal statement, and then you're going to get more specific in your research statement as well. For the research statement, I would say try to sound programmatic. And so, you know, uh, what Katie said is really good advice, you know, uh, have three lines or so. Uh, what I generally do um, is sound, I, I describe three studies that all lead into one another. So here's one study and I discovered this and because I discovered this I ran this study. And sometimes you might not have that. You can make the connection yourself. It doesn't have to be an exact fit into the next study. Um, and then I always, I always suggest my students have a paragraph towards the end that says that you want to go for external grants, you would like to fund people to work in your research group or lab. And then uh, this kind of sounds silly, but I always tell people, come up with a name for your lab, um, a, a good acronym, even though you don't have one yet, just because it might catch somebody. Like mine was the MOVE lab. And now I actually have the MOVE lab. It took me like four years to get it going. But... Um, it might jump out to somebody. And then finally, uh, teaching statement. Uh, what I can add to that is probably that uh, since we're educational psychologists or, or we're related to education in some way, 
I like to call out actual theories and concepts, describe what those are, and then in the next paragraph, say an explicit example or activity where I actually use that theory or concept. Um, you know, a teaching statement shouldn't be all about how you love teaching. You should say that once or twice, but then the rest of it should be, here's what we know from theory and here's how I'm gonna implement it. Um, Uh, ben, when you were talking about a personal statement, did you mean a cover letter or a cover letter? Yeah, okay. sorry, it's okay. a cover letter, letter of interest, personal statement. Okay, yeah, I just I wanted to echo what you said. It, I I was actually surprised when I applied for jobs how many of them actually didn't even ask for a research or a teaching statement. They just asked for a cover letter, references, and CV. So I actually had two versions of my cover letter. One of them was like a longer version if they didn't ask for a research statement where I kind of, I didn't make it as long as my research statement, but I like integrated more <laughs> of my research into it. Um, and then if they did ask for a research statement and a cover letter, I had a shorter version of my cover letter. And then I went into detail in my research statement um, because I just felt like I wanted to, you know, if, if they didn't ask for a research statement, I wanted to communicate my research uh, a little bit more in that cover letter to show the fit. So we, we heard a little bit about some of the things um, you should absolutely include in these materials. Um, what are some of the things you would say like you should not put in there? Like not a good idea to include. Um, if you're thinking about it, don't do it. Jargon and fluff words. <laughs> So um, like saying like, I always make sure to support critical thinking in my classroom and then just kind of leave it there. Like, who cares? Like critical thinking is boring. So and act, rather than saying something like, I challenge students to like rigorously reflect on their own assumptions throughout learning and I do this by making sure I pre-assess their conceptions and then prompt, you know, conceptual, just like something like that, like actually being specific. So if you just have jargon without explaining it or fluff words, that doesn't really show that you know what you're talking about. And as educational psychologists, the bar is kind of higher for us. So like related to Ben's point about, we do have the language for this, but we also need to make sure that we're not, not explaining that. So not everyone on that committee might be an educational psychologist. So making sure you're clear about those terms. Uh, I, I'd add for a, for a CV, uh, don't, make it look cool so you don't need like cool text and you don't need colors you don't need anything like that just just straightforward if you're going to emphasize anything maybe make your name a slightly bigger font but that's it uh, having a funky cv is a good way to get thrown out of the stack <laughs> Um, and something I, I heard as far as the research statement, just like not to do is don't just write about every study that you've ever done in the order that you did it, if, even if it makes no sense or doesn't like tell a story. Um, you, like, like Ben said earlier, I mean, you can kind of finesse that. It doesn't have to be that you actually did it in this order, but if it works for like kind of how you're presenting your story of your research or your research program, um, that's okay to do. Uh, yeah, you just, you don't want it um, to just be like, like a laundry list of the, all the studies that you've done and not really like connecting them or making um, a broader, showing sort of your broader uh, interests and your, the broader questions that you want to answer and your just what your program would look like. And another don't to do would be to not take fit into account. So um, it's great to talk about, you know, either prior external funding or plans for external funding, if that's going to be an appeal to the job you're applying to. But if you're applying to a small teaching focused institution that has maybe a 4-4 load, they're going to wonder, why did you apply to us if you're talking about going after these huge grants? So making sure that you are talking about the things that are important to them and not just having the same application for every job. Or talking about mentoring graduate students if there's an undergraduate institution. Those kinds of things will get you thrown out of the pile. That's a good one. Great. Um, we have a question that just came in here. Um, we'll turn to this one. Um, what are thoughts about bullet points and CVs? Um, I'm assuming this is in reference to Ben's uh, comment about not making it too flashy, try to keep it you know, pretty standard. Um, yeah. yeah, thoughts about that. Yeah, I like it. So um, I would say for 
any research team you've been on or if you've taught a class, I would have one bullet under there. If you want to use bullets, you don't have to. But two to three sentence, three at most, two preferable, of what you did during that. Did you collect data? Did you analyze it? Did you lead the team? Uh, what did you teach in there? Was it face-to-face, -face, hybrid? Was it uh, online? Uh, and just give a little bit description of each without being overly wordy. Mm -hmm. Also, I mean, you can, um, you don't have to put everything that you've ever done on your CV. <laughs> so you should like think about strategically. And again, this is something you can definitely ask your advisor or people who yeah, are more senior to you that can help you think about, okay, is this something that um, is relevant or is it something that was too long ago to where it's not, uh, you know, it's not necessary. So, um, so that's another way that you can kind of uh, get some advice on how to tailor your CV to a particular job. Uh, we have one more question that came in and it's, it's very similar to the last question under um, finalizing job materials. So maybe we can put them together here. Um, so the, the question that came in is, can you talk about good ways to make yourself appealing for a postdoc position that is a bit outside of your previous research area? Uh, similarly, the, the next question we have lined up is uh, tips on making yourself stand out from other candidates. So I think these go hand in hand. Um, some advice I got about a postdoc application was that, so it is a training position, but you also want to focus on not just what you could learn from them, but what you can bring to the table and what, what kinds of uh, unique perspectives or experiences or methodologies or things like that um, can you, like, are you bringing and then how can that kind of fit with the postdoc uh, position that you're applying for and you know what could you what could you learn but also like what can you bring to that position so um, so don't yeah so don't just it's not like you're applying to grad school where it's like oh I have all this stuff to learn you should really also frame yourself as somebody who can bring something um, unique to the table and really contribute like your own skills and experience and knowledge uh, as well yeah uh, i i can speak about the second question so how to make yourself stand out from other candidates honestly and i i know it sounds cliche cliche ish but uh the number one thing we look for is passion we want somebody that's excited somebody who's really enthusiastic who wants to be uh wants to be in academia who really wants to be at that particular university people jump around universities all the time so we're really looking for somebody we think might come and stay for a little while. So do some research on the area, um, do some research on the campus, um, and uh, and then related to that, do your research. So so uh, know about people in the program, know about people in the college or across the university. Um, there, you're almost always going to get a campus tour. Know like a couple things on the tour, like the clock tower. Oh, this clock tower, I read about this. This is awesome. This is like your, your main place where everybody goes and meets after football, whatever it might be, right? Uh, kind of calling that out will make a, a hiring committee go, wow, this person really wants to be here. Yeah, so um, related to that point, um, so I've been able to see a lot of searches and see candidates, and it's surprising how few candidates actually take the time to look up everyone in the department. Um, I once had a candidate on an on-campus job interview ask me how I liked being a grad student. Mm. And I was a fourth year <laughs> faculty member. And they, I was on their schedule. They should have known who I was. Um, and that was not the only one. I had someone else ask what was across the river. And I said, Indiana, like, did you not look us up on the map? So yeah. showing a little bit of interest is fantastic because you're not just joining a program, you're joining a department, you're joining a college. Um, and it's pretty easy to see the difference between a candidate that recognizes those things, like even knowing a little bit about who I am and not saying, oh, how do you like being a grad student? And then when I said I'm faculty, they said, are you really, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I am sure. Um, so knowing who you're joining. So I made, when I was on the market, made flashcards of people in the department and I knew them. I didn't have to know everything about them, but at least know who they were and a little bit about what they did. You'll be surprised at how much that makes you stand out. 
again, and now that we have technology, right? So you don't have to memorize all this stuff. Put it on your phone and in between meetings, yeah. use the restroom or whatever you might do, pull out your phone and look at who you're going to meet next and remind yourself of what they do. And, um, or um, uh, another piece of advice would be try to remember every single person that you meet on the interview. And then when you get home, send an email to every single person individually and say, hey, it was great talking to you. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, after visiting, I think I'd be a great fit and good luck with the job search, whatever it might be. But email everybody back because they'll all remember it. Everyone, including staff who help coordinate your visit, you'd be surprised. They are a valuable member of the community and not everyone remembers to thank them for the time that they invested in your visit. Great. Um, so we're leaving this topic a little bit of um, advice for finalizing job materials and we're moving into um, advice for preparing for Skype or phone interviews and on-campus interviews, which we're starting to get into here. Um, and one of the questions uh, we just got is, is related to that. Um, you know, the, what you're talking about is, is the research that you're doing um, most necessary for, for, I think, the interview phases. Um, yeah, I'm mean, seeing head nods all around. <laughs> Unless maybe it's a job that you're super passionate about and you want to do a little bit more investigative reporting to really tailor your application materials. Yeah, it's best invested in the interview phase. Okay. Um, so question, our next question here. Um, how will the types of questions asked, asked of you differ during uh, a phone or Skype interview from the questions that you might get uh, on an on-campus interview? I don't know, just from my own personal experience, I think, and I could be wrong, I've only had so many interviews, but um, phone interviews and Skype interviews tend to be more broad. And so you'll get the very typical ones, like what are your strengths and weaknesses? I almost always got, how does your research fit the mission of the department? You know, why do you wanna work here? Our first one was YOU, right? That was our first one recently. So have a good answer for those. And then when you get on campus, they're gonna be a lot more specific about your research, about your teaching, about your interests. Um, You'd be surprised how many people on an on-campus interview fumble over the question, why do you want to come here? So it's one that can also make you stand out. Um, for some of the on-campus ones, um, I would recommend getting as many sample interview questions as you can from people. Um, some of the tougher ones are, you know, good to prepare in advance. So I've heard things asked like, how did you deal with a challenging student situation? Or when was the last time you advocated for a student? Or even things like for your research area, what question do you think can never be answered? And so get used to kind of handling those really crazy off the wall questions. As, but it's still focus on why do you want to work here? I've seen people stumble over that and it's mind numbing to me. <laughs> mind blowing. I would also just say, um, as my experience has been that, um, that phone and Skype interviews can be a lot more formal and kind of uh, awkward <laughs> because sometimes they just they just have like a list of questions and they're just going to ask you them and they're not going to they're not going to necessarily respond. They're not going to it's not going to be a conversation. They're not going to maybe they don't even like nod or smile at you. They might just like staring at you so I would just say um, don't get too nervous about that or don't feel like your answers are bad just because you're you know you're on a phone interview and you say something and nobody like asks a follow-up question or responds because um, I definitely got nervous about that where I wasn't sure I was like oh did they not like my answer because they didn't you know there was no follow-up or there were, but I think a lot of times with phone and, and I've never I haven't really been on the other side of things where I'm interviewing other people um, but I do think sometimes they have a lot of people that they're interviewing and they're trying to just get through this list of questions. And so um, I would just say, just keep that in mind that uh, just try not to let that bother you too much or get in the way. I think um, obviously with an on-campus interview, it's in person. So you have that more, like you can kind of see how people are reacting in the moment and um, you can, uh, if you and somebody else have sort of similar interests, you can start to talk about that more and kind of get into that. And I think that can be a little bit harder depending on um, the type of phone or Skype interview that you have. Related, 
uh, during the phone interview, what are some questions that uh, the interviewee should ask? Um, and are there certain questions that you shouldn't ask then? Uh, and what are the questions that you should wait to ask until uh, you're on campus? So I, I was given the advice um, to try to ask questions about uh, kind of what the department is looking to do in the future, how the department is, you know, what is, what are the future plans for where the department is going? Um, kind of like those bigger type of questions and not so much just like, oh, how much, what is the breakdown of teaching and research or like something like that, like something that's more about, yeah, where the department's going so that you can, you show that you're interested in like that sort of the future of the department or um, that sort of thing. Uh, I was also given the advice to not ask anything about salary or anything like that until you get an offer. Um, that was just the advice I got. So like, don't bring that up um, before that time. And so jumping off that point of big questions, you can also tailor it to the fit. So if it's, um, you know, a primarily serving undergrad institution, ask something like, tell me about your students or what was the most surprising thing about your students to show that you understand, you know, that emphasis for the department. But I definitely agree with Katie, don't ask about salary um, up front. And then you can ask a little bit um, about the students specifically. So at OU, a lot of our students are um, working full time, uh, which is not not the same as all universities. So you can ask that. What's what's the general interest of students in research at the graduate and undergraduate level, um, and that that can give you a lot of good information. And then uh, all three of these questions that that were stated also give you an opportunity to kind of respond to them. And so. For example, where do, where do you see the department going in five years or the program? That gives you a good chance to talk about how you fit into that five-year plan. Um, so you wanna ask questions that you can kind of give a little more information to. Um, just as a jumping off point for that, um, it's rare that you see someone take even a broader view of just the department. So you might ask, so kind of building on Katie's question and Ben's point, uh, or your both points, Where's the department going? How do you see that as aligning with the mission of the college and is the university? What's the university's relationship with the city or what's the um, college's relationship with the city? So sometimes we have this very narrow focus, but the further you go along, you realize that you are part of this bigger picture and this bigger community. Uh, quick question coming in here. Um, would you ask about the teaching load during a phone interview uh, before you get called to campus or would you wait? Um, and this is especially at state teaching institutes. I think you, you can probably figure that out through your own research. Um, if they don't say it in the job call, a lot of times they will. They'll say it's a 2-2 or 3-3 and a 4-4. And again, that's how many courses you teach per semester for fall spring but um, you can look up their course schedule you can see how many times a person is on the on the schedule um, you get that information or or you can always email the uh, job search chair uh, they're gonna be kind of your your go-to and your your friend in this uh, process so you can ask some questions They'll send you things like who you're going to talk to if you come on a job interview. And if they don't, you can ask them and they'll send you your itinerary or, or at least the people you meet with. Uh, so, so reach out to that search chair. You can ask who will be on a phone or Skype interview as well if they don't offer that so that you can prepare. Cool. Um, next question in this uh, line of questioning here. Um, what are some things to negotiate for that often get forgotten? It sounds like you wouldn't want to do this until you get an offer, um, but what are some things that, that would come up? Yeah, so uh, definitely get that paper offer first too. So it's not enough to get the offer over the phone. If they call you and say, okay, we want to make you the offer, don't negotiate yet. So they'll tell you the offer and say, great, 
uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that on paper. And then when they send it to you by, via email, which is what they usually do, then you can start negotiating. Uh, you should always try to negotiate salary. They usually won't bump on that, but always ask anyway. Uh, they'll, they'll usually bump a little bit, but not as much as you probably think, but always ask anyway. Um, and then here's the things that I think are often forgotten. Ask for graduate assistance. And everything I'm about to say is soft funds, which means soft funds change from year to year. And so if they have it, they'll, get, they'll give it to you, right? And, and generally there's these random pools of money in, in colleges and departments that they can allocate to, to things like this. As for grad assistance, I'd ask for at least a 0.5, uh, which is 20 hours a week for your first year. Um, ask for travel money. And I would say, don't just say, I need $3,000 for travel. Instead, create two itineraries for a potential travel that you could go on and say, hey, look, this would cost me about $3,200. That's what I would like for my travel money. And then you just made a really good case for getting that. Um, as for technology, and when you do this, uh, go, go for the gold here. Say you want a desktop, a laptop. Do you need uh, recorders for qualitative research? What software do you need? Uh, put it all out there. And then finally, um, your assistant professor salaries uh, can be a little low sometimes. So one thing you might ask for are, are summer funds. Can you be funded for a summer month, which means you get paid on a nine month schedule usually, and then they'll pay you another one of those months salaries um, in the summer. That can be a good way to boost your, boost your salary until you get tenure and fund, fund uh, conducting research during the summer as well. You can also uh, try to negotiate um, how many like course preps that you will need to do pre-tenure. Um, so if you're prepping a new course that it takes a lot of time out of your research. And so if you're trying to get tenure and you're trying to do a lot of research, if you're at a research focused institution, then, um, then that's a good idea. Um, yeah. And just, I guess just get your teaching load in general, uh, you know, again, like you might, it might not always, you might not always get what you want, but you can try to negotiate all these things. Um, and kind of building off both of your points, um, having things in mind for a certain number of years is a good idea. So they might say, oh yes, you'll get travel funds, but you want to specify as many years of that as possible because sometimes they eliminate those or yank those or same things with grad assistance. Um, when you're asking about things like technology or even like a desk chair, like don't assume those things are a given. And if they tell you like, oh, of course you'll get that, ask for it in writing. Everything has to be in writing. So, you know, confirm, please confirm in the contract and the letter that I am going to get those things. Um, other things you might not think of, ask about are um, access to subject pool. If you end up in a college of education, I had asked for access to that. They had never heard of what a subject pool was. They had to go talk to psychology. It turns out that wasn't possible, but it was something to ask for. Um, a lot of it is school dependent. So if you're in a college of education, typically people don't have lab space. It's not like a psychology department. So be somewhat familiar with the resources even available when you're thinking about what to ask for. But um, the subject pool comes to mind as one you might not think about. Uh, we have a quick question here, um, and I'm also watching the time because I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, can the panelists describe more about how the network is involved in the job search? What are the expectations of an advisor slash postdoc advisor, and how much does network factor into navigating the job market? A lot, sort of. I, it totally depends. So um, I found out about my U of L position through my own networking. Someone knew about it and they knew they wanted a human development person in a college of ed and contacted me about it. So networking in general is really important. Um, you can view service, especially that that you do as a grad student as a way to demonstrate that you're competent and get your name out there as someone who's competent. Um, for other things, it might matter, it might not. It's totally luck. I feel like that's depressing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's kind of hard. It's harder for me to say as somebody who hasn't been actually like ever reviewed applications. I've only applied 
Um, but I do think it's, um, it's, it's helpful to have a good network. And I would say just networking in general, and especially just making sure that, um, that you do like, obviously that you do a good job <laughs> and the people that you work with, uh, especially people who are well, more well-known in the field, have a good opinion of you and you volunteer for things and, um, you get involved and that kind of thing like that can really really help you a lot so uh but i mean I, again like it's hard to say it's not like a be-all end-all so i think it just depends a lot yeah and then uh networks do matter but i want to rely entirely on advisors and whatnot like kate said it's good to get involved in graduate student committees um it's good to go to conferences and i know they can get ex expensive but if you can try to make it to one a year, um, ARA or APA. And then there's some really important things to go to at conferences. This, you'd be surprised the sessions are probably the least important thing to go to, at least with regard to networking. Um, you always want to go to a business meeting because it makes you look like you care about the business of a, a division or a SIG. Um, you want to go to as many uh, uh, socials as you can so after after a business meeting they'll usually have a social you want to go to those and introduce yourself to people um, or at least be seen at them um, apply to any grad student seminars Th those are really great um, poster sessions are a great pe place to have good informal uh, conversations with people um, so just just being seen and, and showing up to things and volunteering and, and talking to people really go a long way in networking yeah and I would say even just navigating navigating the job market the job that I have now when I was applying I had I had a friend who was at my same level that I had met at networking and he was very familiar with the department that I was applying for and he really helped me a lot as far as um, understanding the department and things like that. So definitely don't discount networking with people at your same level yeah. because ultimately like they're gonna help you a lot too as you both kind of go through your careers and um, it's just good to kind of know people and have people know who you are. Yeah, and yeah. be competent, be known for being competent. Yeah. yeah, and then, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, a lot of times these jobs come out in July and August and a conference like APA is in August. There's another conference, uh, SciPi, the Southwest Consortium for Innovative Psychology and Education. It's in November. And you can go to these places where you know uh, people that at those institutions will be. So for instance, when I knew the OU job came out in August, I went to APA and talked to all the OU people I could find because uh, I really like Norman a lot. And so um, I, I knew the jobs coming out and, and talked to people that worked there. All right, I'm watching the time here. So I think I'm gonna to get to our last question here. Um, what is the best advice you received um, related to job market things? Uh, and what do you wish you knew that you know now um, when you were going into it? Stay off the psychology jobs wiki. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really tempting to do it, but it can be really anxiety provoking. Sometimes second choices get hired and you don't wanna know that you were the second choice. Um, so stay off of it. Uh, when I was on the market, I actually didn't know that people posted updates about interviews and it was a very soul crushing experience. So stay off the wiki. Um, try not to get up in the social comparison game. It's, it's, it's stressful. Um, and the only other language, which is our advice, which turned out to be really helpful for tenure too, was especially for women, watch that really soft language. Things like I helped on this grant or I assisted. You want to say like, I owned this grant. I rocked this grant. I did these papers. Um, so have someone even read over your materials and get rid of that soft language. Um, so I... Being a very a person who is very anxious and over prepares and over like stresses out about things. I mean, so if you're not one of those people, I would say definitely like when you're when you're going on your interviews, really really prepare, like really um, really put a lot of effort into that. But then ultimately, you know, once you prepare, just 
go on the interview and know that like not every interaction is going to go perfectly. That doesn't mean like you're, you're going to have some kind of awkward interaction with somebody. Um, it's okay. It doesn't mean that um, you're not going to get an offer or that they don't like you. Um, I guess just, just don't, you can't be too perfectionistic about everything. I mean, obviously you want to put your best foot forward and try to be the best that you can, but um, don't let those little things like trip you up and um, make you lose your confidence. So just try to be yourself and be respectful and, uh, you know, um, just know that a lot of it is about fit. And if you present yourself well and you do the best job that you can, then, you know, it's kind of, you've at least shown them who you are. And so then they can decide, um, you know, and you can decide as well, like if you think that that's a good fit. So my piece of it, pieces of advice would be number one, uh, as soon as you get off the airplane, you're on the interview. So if they send a car to pick you up, the driver, uh, even if the person is a professional driver, is interviewing you. If you're driving around with a real estate agent looking at houses, there's a chance they know somebody in the department and they're interviewing you. So no matter what, until you get off the plane and then until you get back on it, uh, you want to be there. You're excited about it. This job is uh, this job is awesome. It's your dream job, uh, even if it's not. Uh, say all those things to everybody you meet because uh, everybody is interviewing you. Um, the second thing I'd say is I know this is easier said than done, uh, especially where you're at in, in your your career. But try to enjoy the process. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's really stressful, but at the same time, uh, if you get a campus interview, this is like the only time in your whole career where, where they're going to wine and dine you and, and treat you like a rock star. Because uh, once you show up, you're just, you're, you're get to work. You know what I mean? Not that it's bad, but um, I'm tr so just try to have fun with it, even though I know that's an annoying thing to say to you right now. I'm laughing at Kate laughing at <laughs> I have the worst facial expression. <laughs> yeah, try to regulate your facial expressions on the Skype interview. <laughs> uh, well, I want to thank our panelists for doing this, uh, Dr. Kate Snyder, Dr. Katie Minx, and Dr. Ben Hetty. Um, I really appreciate it. I know the rest of the SIG really appreciates it. Um, I'm gonna put in a quick plug for the Motivation uh, Grad Student SIG. Um, Peter just posted a link in the chat um, and you also got this in your email please take the survey um, so we can get some feedback on the live job panel um, we hope you all really enjoyed it and we'd love to hear feedback on if we what we should do next um, we're always looking for people in the uh, grad committee as well so if you're interested please send myself or peter um, an email